Good morning, everyone. It's about time for us to begin our services, and we're thankful for everyone being here this morning, and glad to see everyone survived the snow ice apocalypse. And so we're, we're glad you're here, and we just hope and pray that we can enter into this worship in spirit and truth. Our first song will be number 891, 891, and after we sing the song, we're going to come straight into uh, 133 in the supplement book. morning I'll be reading from this, the uh, book of 2 Peter, first chapter, I'll be reading the first 11 verses. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love, 
For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we just thank you so much that we can be here this morning and worship you, that we can be in association and fellowship with one another. We just thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and for protecting us as we've gone through some rough weather this past week. Lord, we pray that you will be with us today as we worship, that our worship will be pleasing, acceptable to you, that it will be beneficial to each of us and build us up and help us to be stronger, more determined to live for you, to be all that you want us to be. Lord, we're mindful of some who are sick and who are facing some very difficult times in their life, and we pray you'll be with them and give them healing if it's your will, give them peace and strength, and above all else, increase their faith that they will trust in you. Help us, Lord, as a church to reach out to those around us that we might truly share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we might bring those who are lost to you and help them to want to serve you. We pray, God, that you'll forgive us when we do wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. being with us. Is there anyone that needs a copy of the lesson sheet? Ephesians 1, actually the whole book of Ephesians now. Uh, we are in chapter 4. We are uh, ready for about verse 15 uh, in our discussion. Uh, I've, I've read the whole section the last two Sundays. I'm not going to read it this morning, but uh, as as we think about what Paul is saying here in, in this chapter, he's telling us that uh, we're all to be one in Jesus Christ and we're all to live for Him and serve Him and we're to work together to do that. And, and he talks about the different ones. There's uh, one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one, grace is given. And so each of us have various... Uh, gifts that God has given us to be able to do different things. And so uh, we, we don't all have the, the same abilities and so on. But he goes on and he says that he gave some, as verse 11, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, uh, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result, we're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects in him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And we talked about, down through verse 14, we talked about the fact that each of us has different gifts and there's different things that we can do and 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 the church the body of christ the church needs every aspect of every work that each of us can do 
uh, whether it be in a public way or, or privately or whether it be as a part of the church itself and the work of the church or if it be things we do as individuals, each of us has our part to play and each of us does our part to, to build up the whole body. Uh, and, and the fact is the church here at Ephesus will never be what God wants it to be unless all of us are doing our part. Uh, and, and if all of us are doing our part, then we will become what God wants us to be. And so it's, it's important that each of us recognize the importance of what we can do and the importance of who we are as, as a part of the body of Christ. Uh, it's easy for us to, to think, well, you know, uh, whatever work needs to be done, that's, that's Matt and Robert's job. They're the preachers. Let them do it. Or that's the elder's job. Let them do it. Or that's the teacher's job. Let them do it. Well, the fact is it takes everybody doing everything, not just the, the public faces that you see when we come together. Uh, but all of us have to do our part, and, and that is a very, very important part. In verse uh, 16, Robert, yeah. When I'm thinking about this, each one doing his part, it always comes to my mind about the old elderly man that always sat on the front seat uh, in every uh, worship service. He, he never led prayer. He never uh, led singing. Uh, uh, never did anything public. Process of time, he passed away. And when the members came in on Sunday morning, the building was freezing cold. So each one does it in his part. Yeah. Okay. yeah, he came and that was back when they had wood stoves, and he'd come and stoke the fire and get everything going and have, have it ready for him. He was doing, that was his part. Yeah. Uh, I had an interesting thing happen this past week. I, I'm not going to tell you the guy's name, but I actually uh, contacted the guy and asked him if he'd be interested in teaching a class here. He's, he's done it several times in different churches uh, on the minor prophets. And I asked him would he be interested in coming. And if he was, then I was going to get with the elders and talk to them and see if they would agree to it. And, and I felt sure they would. But uh, anyway, he, he said... Uh, he said, well, I'd love to, but I'm already teaching a class on Wednesday night at this one church, and this other one's already got me lined up when this one's over to do one at that church. And, and, I, and he's not a preacher, and he's not anybody that, that most of you, some of you know him just because you are kin to him or you know who he is. But the fact is, he's not somebody that's well known. Uh, if, if you mentioned his name in churches around Limestone County, very, very few people would have ever even heard of him. And yet he does a tremendous work in teaching Bible classes uh, and, and he goes to different churches and stuff, and even though he's a member of one local church here in the county, and that's where he attends, unless he's teaching a class somewhere else, that's where he is all the time. Very faithful, but, but he's not one of these that you would think of when you think of somebody that's really out doing a lot of work, and he's probably doing as much, as, as much teaching uh, as any, anybody in Limestone County is. Uh, and, and so you don't ever know who, who really can do the do what? And, and there's just a lot that all of us can do. And that's, I think that's the thing that uh, we should do. I sort of skipped over verse 15. He says, We are to speak the truth in love and grow up in all aspects in Him who is the head, even Christ. First of all, we're to speak the truth. Uh, and of course, he's talking here not just about our conversation, but he's talking about our teaching. Uh, in this context. Now, it's true that we should speak the truth just in, in our conversation. In fact, as, as we get on over later in this same chapter, he's going to tell us not to lie, but to tell the truth. So that's an important part of Christian life. But here in this context, he's talking about, as far as our teaching is concerned, that we are to teach the truth. But we're to do it in love. Uh, I, I've, I've mentioned this before, but back several years ago, and, and I did not hear this conversation, but the person who told me was really disgusted and turned off and had a, lost a lot of respect for the man who said it. But one Monday morning, he was in a, one of the little country stores where everybody would gather, all the men would come and gather on Mondays, and this one preacher came in, and uh, he started bragging about how he had gotten them told yesterday. Well, that really bothered this guy. He was a young man at the time, very young man. 
at the time. And, and it really bothered him, and it stuck with him. He's an old man now, but it has stuck with him all of his life about this preacher that was so bragging about getting them told. Well, that's not the job of a preacher is to get people told. The job of a preacher is to build them up in love. And that, that's what we're supposed to do as teachers, as preachers. We have to speak the truth. Now, sometimes, if you're speaking the truth, there are going to be people that are not going to like it. Paul talks to Timothy and Titus both several times about those that have a morbid interest in controversy, about those that would not hold to the truth, about those that are false teachers. But I think one of the things that is a key to this is we need to remember that I'm not the standard and my understanding is not the standard of truth. And your understanding is not the standard of truth. Now I believe what I believe and I believe it very strongly and I believe it's based on what the Bible teaches and I try to stick to it and stand with it and teach it and preach it. But the fact is I always keep just sort of a little reserve back there in the back of my head. I could be wrong. <laughs> I may not have, un, have, have the right understanding about it. And so when somebody comes along and they say, well, I don't agree with what you're saying there. I think that, that you're wrong about that. Then I shouldn't get upset about it. I shouldn't get angry. I should just simply say, okay, why do you feel that way? Show me in the Bible why you think that what I'm saying is wrong. And that should be our attitude. And, and the fact is, if in fact they can show me that I'm wrong and I learn something better, and I change my mind about it, then I have grown and I have matured spiritually, and that's great. What could be better than that? On the other hand, if after studying it, I have decided that they are wrong and I am right, and I've tried to do it open-mindedly and fairly with the Scripture, then I have strengthened my conviction and my faith in what I believe. And, and so I think we always have to keep that in the back of our mind. And so not just because, you know, I don't think we should brand everybody we disagree with as a false teacher. In fact, almost always in the New Testament, when you read about a false teacher, it's somebody that denied the Lord Jesus, or it was somebody that denied the resurrection of Jesus, or it was somebody that said Jesus has already come back again. I mean, it, it was people that were denying the very basic tenets of what Christianity is all about. Those were the people that were labeled false teachers. And when somebody got up and taught something that wasn't right, Aquila and Priscilla took them aside, taught them the way of the Lord more perfectly. When some of them were teaching something that wasn't right, Paul took them aside and he said, uh, you know, into what were you baptized? Do you know the Holy Spirit? And they said, we don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. And so they, he explained to them, and then he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so the fact is, just because somebody has to say something different doesn't... It, it should not make us immediately label them as false teachers. And I think we need to be careful about that. Well, yeah. Like with oh, yeah. To me, yes. Uh, it says that we should no longer be children in 14, but 15 by speaking the truth in love. You know, there were those that were in 14 there that was uh, uh, teaching false doctrine, whatever trickery I mean. Yeah. And craftiness. And, and that is the false teacher. Those that are intentionally deceiving people. They don't care about the truth. What they care about is gaining a following after their own way and what they're saying. And in fact, not only is it connected, it's still the same sentence, actually. <laughs> 14, 15 is all part of the same sentence. And so, yeah, he's saying, don't go along with all of that. Mature spiritually enough that you're not just led astray with everything that comes along. And this person says that and this person says that. One of the things that I have found interesting over the years is I have seen congregations that would all just about almost unanimously believe something uh, and, and go along with it, and then they would change preachers who did not agree with that first preacher on that particular subject, and then five years later, almost nobody in that church believed what that other one did. But if they change preachers again and they get one that will believe what the first one did, give them five years and they're all back over there again. Well, what happens is you have people that are just following along because that's what somebody said. And it doesn't make any difference how many times I say something, that doesn't make it right. 
It should be based on what the Bible says. And just because you got a different preacher that's saying something a little bit different doesn't mean that you change your opinion every time. Study what the Bible says and then stick to what the Bible says. And so he says, speaking the truth, but speaking it in love. And this is our attitude about it. Uh, and this goes back to what I was talking about. You know, it's not our job to get somebody told. It's our job to speak the truth in love. Um, the way we approach somebody that we disagree with, not necessarily what we say as much as how we say it, will either cause that person to put up a wall and become very defensive very quickly, or it will tear down the wall and open up the way to a good, meaningful discussion. And that has about 99% to do with the way we act toward that person, not necessarily what we say. And so we need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. Do it with the right attitude. A soft answer turns away wrath, we read in the Proverbs. And, and so, you know, we, we, we need to practice that. All right. Any questions down through verse 16? We've pretty much discussed all of that. Uh, he says, But speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all aspects into Him, even Christ. So we're, we're growing up in Christ. And it's from Him that the whole body is fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. So it's the body of Christ, but we are the members of that body, and we supply as the various parts of the body, we make it complete. And so we all grow up together in love. All right, anything else on, on those? We'll go, if not, we'll go to the questions. All right, question number one. What does Paul mean when he says he was a prisoner of the Lord? Back in verse one. Okay, he was a prisoner as a result of his service to the Lord. Because of his preaching the gospel, because of his being a Christian, he was being held as a prisoner. Uh, how does he tell them that they ought to walk? Okay, he says, walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called. So the way they are to walk is to walk in a manner worthy of the way uh, they have. Now, number three, if our salvation is not by works, and we saw that in chapter 2, verse 9, uh, how can we be worthy of the calling we have from God? Okay, living our life daily for God. Okay. Do what? Okay, we're in the body of Christ. Okay, Joel. Yeah. We also live a life of and humility Okay, by living in humility and gentleness, which. Okay. Yeah, and, and if you look at this, he doesn't say walk in a life that is worthy, but he says walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And, and I think that the word manner makes a big difference. We live as Christians on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, it's not the, our salvation then is not on the basis of how well we live as a Christian. While we should be striving to do the very best we can to be as much as we can like God and like Jesus Christ and do what's right in every way. You know, he says back in chapter 2, you remember in verse 10, you remember what he said? He, he said in verse 9 that it's not as a result of works that no one should boast. But then in verse 10 he says, for we are his, talking about God, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepare, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we walk in a way that demonstrates that we are Christians. We live in a way that shows other people that we are Christians. And so Paul said, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. Uh, and, and so Jesus said, uh, let your good works, your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your Father 
who is in heaven. So they see God when they see the way we work, the way we walk. So it's not a matter of earning our salvation by all these good things that we do. We do them because we are Christians. We do them because we are children of God. All right. Now, Paul gives five things, at least, uh, that are related to our attitude. What are these five things that he lists, first of all? First one is what? Humility, or okay, or meekness. All right, the next one is gentleness, okay. And some translations put meekness for gentleness, and some translations put meekness for humility. They are very closely related. Uh, they both are an attitude from within. Uh, they both, uh, what, is, what is meekness? What is humility? I think they're, they're very closely related. What are those two? Okay. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians on one occasion, he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Uh, in other words, Paul didn't say, you know, look at me, I'm an apostle. Uh, you know, I'm one of the, the biggest name preachers around today uh, and, and brag about how many people he had converted to Christ. No, Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And we saw that in chapter 1. We see it here in chapter 4. He begins his conversation by saying, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And so he's, you know, he's not exalting himself. Uh, and and it's, it's a matter of knowing who we really are in our relationship to God and in our relationship to others. In Philippians chapter 2, when Paul is describing humility and he uses Jesus as an example he says that we're to follow the example of Jesus in humility who gave up all the glories of heaven, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and became a man taking the form of a servant or a bondservant and then, then even died on the cross. And then he says that we are uh, to consider others ahead of ourselves. That's humility. When we look out for the good of others ahead of our own good. Uh, then, then that's humility. I, I, I knew of a, a man one time that was offered a job uh, and it, it paid a good bit more than what he was doing. It's the same kind of job, but it, it paid a good bit more than what he was making where he was. Uh, and he had a pretty good sized family and he could have definitely used the money. But he knew a young, younger man who was just getting started out that needed a place to work and he needed that kind of a job, and he was qualified for it. And so he recommended to the people that they hire the young man instead of hiring him uh, because he wanted to help the other person out. That's humility. That, I think that's a good example of it. All right, what is, what's the next thing that he mentions? Humility and gentleness, and then what? Long-suffering or patience. Okay, patience or long-suffering. Uh, and... and uh, That one sometimes is not easy. What does it mean to be patient or long-suffering? The, the word long-suffering really describes it better than the word patience, I think. Do what, Bob? Show self-restraint in the face of provocation. Okay. Show self-restraint in the face of provocation. Okay. What would you say, Dwight? Bearing with one another. Okay. Bearing with one another. Okay. Just put up with, yeah. In just very simple terms, that's really what it means. Just putting up with a whole lot of stuff you don't like to put up with. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you're the only one that's going to make this situation peaceful. Okay, yeah. Sometimes you are the only one that will make it peaceful with some patience. Uh, when, when, when and where in our lives is patience needed? <laughs> just about everywhere. Do what? Sitting at a railroad track. Okay. If there's a train going by, then it's, uh, some people have a real hard time being patient. Uh, but, you know, Matt's talked several times, and I've mentioned it a time or two myself, about uh, having patience when I'm driving down the road and, and some idiot is doing something really stupid uh, that bothers me. 
Uh, you know, and, and that describes how we feel about it sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the fact is, we need it with our children. We need it with our grandchildren. Of course, we don't ever have to be patient with our husband and wife, do we? That's, that's not. Yeah, that, that takes, sometimes that takes a whole lot of patience, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was heading to work the other day. In fact, actually, I was coming back from lunch, and, and I, was, I had run myself a little short, and I was about to run out of time getting back. And uh, not only was there a train, but it was coming to a stop. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's when it really takes some patience. But I sat there for about 30 seconds, and I thought, no, this ain't going to work. <laughs> He's going to be here a while. It's where there's a sidetrack, and I knew what was going on. They were pulling off on the sidetrack and stopping. Or actually, they were stopping before the sidetrack so the one coming the other way could get off on the sidetrack, and then they could go. So I had to wait on two trains, one to come and stop, and the other one then to take off and start. So I went around a different way and came back, and sure enough, they were still had it blocked when I got, got to work. But, but yeah, sometimes, you know, we, we have to exhibit some patience. And in, in any relationship with people, I don't care what the relationship is with people, there is a need for patience. That, that's true in every relationship we have. Uh, and, and so patience is something that we as Christians need to work on. I mentioned earlier when we were talking about this, if you go over and you look at uh, Galatians chapter 5 and you look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's almost exactly the same things that he lists here. Uh, and so and patience is one of the things that's, that's mentioned there. So we, we're to have humility and meekness and patience or long-suffering. And what's another one? Forbearance. forbearance. Okay. Now, forbearance and patience or, or long-suffering are, are very closely related again, sort of like the meekness and the humility. Uh, forbearance. Uh, and this really carries with it, in addition to patience, the idea of putting others ahead of ourselves. I think that is part of forbearance. And then he says we do all of that in what? In love. Okay. Love is, uh, in, in the book of Colossians, it's referred to as the perfect bond of unity. It's what ties us all together. Uh, and, and so it's to be done in love. Jesus, uh, well, number five, what is the importance of love in a Christian's life? It should be the basis for it, be the basis for it. yeah. God is, love. God is love. First John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, we love, we love because God loved us. God is love. Uh, and in, chapter, in verse 20 and 21 of that same chapter, if we don't have love, uh, then we're not really children of God. How can we love God whom we have not seen if we don't love our brother whom we have seen? Uh, Jesus says in John 13 and verse 35, He says, By this all men will know my disciples. They have love for one another. Uh, and, and so love is the basis of what it's all about. We became Christians because of God's love. Love is not, 1 John 4, 10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Love doesn't come from us first. It comes from God first. And then we accept His love, and then we learn to love as God loves. And so love is the, the basis of it all. And the love that He's talking about, and I, I think that it's extremely important for us to see that, the love that He's talking about here is not just a feeling, but it is an action. You know, God so loved that He gave. Uh, and so love is an action. It is doing what is best for other people under all circumstances. Looking out for their good and doing what's good and best and right uh, is, is what love really is about. And then when you get on down to chapter 5, which is not too far away from where we are, he begins chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. And so 
we are to be like God, and if we're going to be like God, we have to love. All right, he says we're to be diligent to do what? Okay, to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is the basis of the unity? Okay. Okay, when, when we become Christians, uh, we are added to the Lord's church. And, and God is the one who does the adding. He's the one that makes us members of His family. In 1 John chapter 1, uh, there, I was trying to see which verses I had in mind. Uh, verse 3, he says, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And what he's saying here is, if I'm in fellowship with God and you're in fellowship with God, then we have fellowship with each other. The basis of this unity that we have, this fellowship, and the word fellowship means to jointly participate, to share. And that is the unity we have, is this fellowship is the same thing as the unity. And he says, we have this because we are in fellowship with God, and, and because we are in fellowship with God, we are in fellowship with each other. Uh, and there's a number of other passages that would, that would point this out uh, as well. And so, uh, in, in one, let me, I, I wrote down one here and I don't remember what it said. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. Okay, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 1 says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we are called into fellowship with, with God, we're called into fellowship with Christ, we're called into fellowship with each other. And so the, we, are, we all are, are one because of what God has done for us. What is the bond of peace? Okay. It's the agreement that we have with God and with each other that we're going to get along with each other. Does that mean we won't ever disagree on anything? No, it doesn't mean we won't ever disagree. You know, we, we have, the, the fact is, we, we have this unity and this bond. Diane and I have been married now for 50-something years, and, uh, and and we are, you know, truly one in so many ways, and we have this bond that we, we are together, uh, and, and I'm just always afraid that one of these days we may have a disagreement. Uh, we have plenty of disagreements, but that doesn't change the fact that we're still one. We still, you know, we work them out. We talk about them. We figure out what's right what's wrong, and... And we come to some kind of, she started the discussion yesterday. She said, can I talk to you about this without you getting upset about it? I said, well, it depends on what you say. <laughs> uh, then I said, not really. I was just kidding. I said, what do you want to say? What do you want to talk about? And she talked about it and explained some things to me from her perspective, which was totally different from what I said I wanted and what I intended to do. And, and after she explained it and explained her reasons, my reply was, well, that makes good sense. And I think you're probably right. That's what we ought to do. The fact is, we, we need to be agreeable, and this is a part of patience and forbearance and all these other things that we were talking about a while ago. And, and that's how we preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And it works in marriage. It works with our children. It works in the church. And, and we need to, when we have a disagreement, we need to work it out and talk to each other and remember that we're all in this together and we're one and we're just trying to do what's best for everybody and follow the will of the Lord. Okay, that, that's in verse 3. Verse 4, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were calling, one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. That's verses 4 through 6. What is the one body? The church, okay. 
uh, in uh, verses 15 and 16, he talks about the fact that Christ is the head and the whole body grows up in Him. If you go back to chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23, he specifically says there that the body of Christ is the church. And so, so we're talking about the church. Uh, and, and the church is that which belongs. It is all of the people that are saved. That, it, their church is used in two senses in the Bible. First of all, in the broadest sense, it is used as all of the people that are saved, both living and dead. Uh, that, that makes up the whole church. And then also in, in the New Testament, the word church is sometimes used in a local sense. He talks about the church at Corinth, or he talks about the church at Rome, uh, or the church in Jerusalem. And so he, he talks about a local congregation as the church. And, and so you have to look at the context to see which he's talking about. But in both cases, it is people who have been called out of the world, who have been forgiven of their sins, and now they are a part of the body of Christ. And that's, that's what the church is. All right, questions, comments down through there. If not, we will stop and pick up next week, Lord willing, with number 10. Good morning. So good to see everyone here this morning, and especially if you're visiting, we invite you and give you a special welcome and invite you back at any opportunities you have to worship here with us at Ephesus. And if you're a first-time visitor, we'd ask you to please fill out one of the visitor's cards, which is on the back of the pew in front of you, and put it in the collection plate when you leave so that we can have a record of your attendance. And uh, to our regular members, thank you so much for being here. And we're so happy to see Brother Bob Brooks able to be with us this morning, and also uh, Brother Thomas and Betty Wells being with us this morning. Uh, hadn't seen them in a while, and we really appreciate their being here this morning. Uh, Brother Bob tells me that Sister Joyce is still having problems with her back, uh, real painful problems with her back. So. Let's remember her in our prayers. And also, uh, many of us here know uh, Brother Dave Eves, and he is having uh, pancreatic problems and is going to have tests this week. So uh, they request our prayers on his behalf. So let's, let's remember him also. Is there any other sick that needs to be mentioned at this time? I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of it. Uh, the congregation here at Ephesus provides the gospel minutes that uh, we get once a week through the mail. And uh, if you're a member here and you're not getting the gospel minutes, please let either Joel or I or Robert or Matt one or Brother Bob know, and, and we'd be glad to get you on the mailing list. Uh, that's, that's free to everyone uh, here at Ephesus, and the, the gospel minutes has been... Uh, uh, coming out to the public for many, many years, and it's really a good uh, good program. And also, we've had several changes to our church directory over the past few months. And uh, if you'd like to have an updated paper copy of the directory, please let uh, Brother Joel know, and he'll be able to get you an updated uh, direct church directory. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Pilot. Pilot. Okay, let's remember them. 
anything else that needs to be mentioned. I'll turn the service over, Brenda. To help us to prepare our minds that we're about to take the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 203. Number 203. We'll sing just the first three verses only. Man of thanks for the loaf. Father, thank you again for this beautiful Lord's Day you've blessed us with and the measure of health you've given each of us that we can gather here with those of like precious faith to worship you in spirit and in truth, we do pray. And at this time, to gather around this memorial table, this memorial to your Son and our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his lifeblood on the cross for the remission of our sins. Father, we thank you for this bread which represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross that he gave and the, the awful suffering he went through on our behalf to pay the debt that we can never pay on our own. We thank you for this bread and we pray your blessings on this bread as we partake of it, that we will do so in a way and a manner as pleading itself in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us again bow. Our dear Heavenly Father, in light manner, we ask you to bless this cup, the fruit of the vine, that so fitly represents Jesus' blood shed on the cross for our sins. And we pray, Father, that you, again you be with us as we partake of it. We'll do so in a worthy manner. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
We'll sing number 408, our next song. We'll sing the first three verses, and then we'll sing the chorus after the third verse. And uh, we'll sing softly and, and, and slow for the first two and a half verses, and after the, the middle of the third verse, we'll pick it up the tempo and sing out. So please be with that. Move me so low in the grave he laid, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord.
us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've blessed us with so that we can come out and study another portion of your word and sing songs and pray and hear and gather around your table. Father, we're so thankful for you and what you've done for us and that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins and we pray that you will forgive us of our sins because we sin so very much. Father, we help us to remember that you are Jehovah and that we are to praise you and that this world is not about us, it's about you and, and gaining more souls to further your kingdom. Father, we pray for the sick of our number that you will heal, heal, heal them and, and bless them with the help that they, that they need. Be with the ones that's got the COVID and help them. Be with the ones in Texas, Father, that are struggling with the no power, no water, and no food. Be with them and comfort them and, and help them through this difficult time and help us to do what we can for them. Father, we are so thankful that you got us through this week and safely and that um, nobody got hurt or injured and we're thankful that we could all be here today. Father, we're, uh, as we're about to have our lesson, please be with the one that's prepared it so that he can deliver it in, to us in such a way that we can as listeners can take it and to apply it to our daily walks of life. We pray for the ones that's lost loved ones that you will comfort them in a way that only you can. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The song before our lesson will be number 15 in the supplement. Number 15. And, and anyone who like can stand as we sing the song. Well, good morning. It is good to be here and to be able to be with you. And uh, it's uh, good to be able to uh, rest. And uh, Brother Bruce uh, sent me a text yesterday. We were talking and he said, uh, what are you going to preach about? And I, we were talking about resting. And I said, well, I think I may uh, wake up, go to church, sleep. Then uh, when we leave church, I'll go eat lunch and then go home and take a nap and then wake up and come back to church and then go back home and go to sleep again. And so uh, I was really thinking about on the seventh day he rested because that would be a sermon I could really live out today. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much I could talk about it, but we could, li we could live it out. But uh, I, I wanted to think about uh, it's kind of something that, that happened multiple times over the week and you can... You can ask Adam, 
Uh, you feel like you wasted your time. And why do you feel like you wasted your time, you may ask. You know, we, so many people and, and many of you called and text appreciation. And uh, well, well, the reason we feel like it might be a waste of time at, at moments was uh, you might go to the same road three or four times because it kept going, kept going back out. And uh, this one particular lady, uh, she asked me, she said, my lights have been out four times over the storm. And I said, well, it'll probably go out five times before it's all said and done. And she said, well, why can't y'all fix it? Why can't y'all fix it? And I said, well, I don't control the weather. And as soon as it'll thaw out, it should be done. But as long as it's still frozen, these pine trees and limbs are still going to be popping and breaking and and about the time I got that out of my mouth, one broke off in the woods. And I said, you see that? And I said, it just wasn't over your line this time. So, so you may do all this and, and you feel like it's a waste. And I don't know how many times we'd go back to the same place or the same road, the same area, and it, you'd do it all over again. You feel like you kinda, you, you're wasting your time. In, in the Bible, we read of a moment where the question is asked, why, why this waste? Why are you wasting this time? Why are you wasting this precious perfume? In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 6, it says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of a very expensive ointment. She poured it out on his head and he as as he reclined at the table, and when the disciples saw it, they were indignant and saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and, and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, and said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always will have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment out on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this, gospel, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now in John chapter 12, it, it has this event uh, that I believe it's the same event recorded for us. Now, six days before the Passover, Jesus Therefore came to the Bethany where Lazarus was and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. And Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment and made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas is carried at one of his disciples he who was about to betray him said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charged the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Why this, why this waste? Why, why, why this waste, uh, Judas asked, and, and more specifically, he said, this could have been sold for 300 denarii worth of money. This is a, a denarii we, we would consider a day's wage, so 300 days wages. This is a year's worth of money. And she is just wasting it. Think of all of the good that we could do with this. And many times people ask us the same thing. Oh, well, why, why are we wasting something? Why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your money? Why are you wasting your emotions? You shouldn't waste your money on that. That's just, that's just one of the ways they get you. Uh, you shouldn't be wasting your time like that. You're feeling around. You only have so many heartbeats and here you are. You only have so much limited time on this earth. It is like a vapor. Is this how you want to spend your vapor of time on earth? And you need to get over yourself and quit wasting all your time on all these emotions and feeling sorry for yourself. You need to get over yourself. Why are you wasting dot, dot, dot? You know, this is, not, this is not some new question. This is not something that, that just recently came up. It is not a new feeling. 
It is not something new within even the scriptures. There in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and there was Eve and, and they, they went throughout the garden and, and tended to it and they, they had everything at their everything that they could ever want, anything that they desired. And there was a tree that was forbidden for them. And then here is Satan who takes the form of a serpent and, and he says to Eve, he says, why are you wasting this tree? I know God told you that you shouldn't be eating of this tree, and that, but look at it. Do you think God would have made a tree that is so good and so pure and you'll be like God? You can eat of any tree in the Garden of Eden. Are you you're just going to let this one rot and waste? What about Job's friends and family and, and even his wife? Why do you keep doing this? Why is it that you keep serving God? Just curse God and die, Job. Just be done with it. Quit wasting your life serving after Him. All of this could be over with if you would just... Leave God. You keep serving God and, and you think God is loving and merciful and, and is going to take care of you and has blessed you so much. But if a God really did all that for you, Job, would this be happening to you now? Just leave God. Everyone, Everything in Job's life was taken from him. Well, except for his wife. Uh, we won't go there. So why is it that, that Job continually... Serve God. Well, it wasn't wasteful to Job to keep serving God. And people even challenge us today saying that we're wasting our life in our devotion to God. That you YOLO, right? You only live once. You got, you got to live it up. You, you, you only have so much time on this earth, you want to waste it away to some, some fairy godfather? Why, why do all that? Live your life. Live your best life now. We're wasting our life and our devotion to God. That's what people want to say to us. That's what people think about maybe you or I and, and the way that we do things and why we're gathered together and we finally have a beautiful beautiful day over the last 10 days where the sun is shining and things are thawing out. It would be a, but you're here. Why are you wasting this day? Why are you wasting this morning going to church? Sacrifices made to God cannot be counted. And the reason that we kind of come to this idea is that God's love cannot be counted. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable are His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. And to Him be glory forever. Amen. And we make sacrifices to God. That's a good thing. And, and sacrifices that we, we make to God should be encouraged and, and should be you know, a commendable thing. But if we're making sacrifices to God just so everybody else can see us make sacrifices to God, that's not a good thing. And we're not really doing it for the glory of God or, or to the benefit of God. We're, we're doing it for the benefit of ourselves. And when Mary comes in and Jesus is reclined at the table and she begins to pour out this oil on him and to, to wipe his, his feet with her hair and to cleanse him and to anoint him with that oil, she wasn't doing it for the crowd. She wasn't doing it for all those sitting at the table. She was doing it because she wanted to give Jesus something. After all that he had done and after all he was doing and all that she knew that he would be doing in the future, she wanted to give something back to him. The love of God is, on, uh, is something that cannot be counted. Oh, the riches and the depth of God's love and mercy. Oh, how it is the fact that, that we could never, ever give back to God what He has given to us. 
We, we, we should not even count it. That we, we, anything that we give to God, we shouldn't keep up with it in, in some kind of tally scoring mechanism and say, well, you know, I did this for God and I did this for God and I gave this for God because he's got the trump card. And no matter what we did in our lives, we can never repay him for the love and the gift that he, have, that he has given us through his son. But yet we continually sacrifice and we give back to God and we, we do things for God because we are appreciative of the gift that he gave each and every one of us. He loved us and he loved us first and he loved us bigger and greater than we ever could. We think about how valuable this perfume was and, and how long did, did Mary have this in her family or, or how did they acquire this oil or this perfume and, and what did they go through to get it and, and how was it that they came about it? How long had they had it and what special events had they used it for before in their lives? You know, had they used it on a wedding day? Had they used it maybe when, when a family member was born or did, did they use it... Uh, when they became mature of age, how was it that, that this was used before? And we, we mentioned a moment ago, a year's pay was the monetary value uh, that, that Judas put on it in John chapter 12 and verse 5. Nobody ever thought it was a waste. Nobody ever said before. Nobody ever said that we have record of, obviously, but nobody ever thought, you know, well, you're wasting that oil at any point where they had used it before. But now that it is all gone, it's considered a waste. And people look at living a Christian life in much of the same way. They don't really consider the fact that you're wasting your life as long as you dabble a little bit in church. They think that's a good thing. and It's a good thing to do, be a good person and to, and to have love and to take care of the poor. And as long as you just dabble in Church, that, that's a good thing. But whenever you devote your whole life to service unto God, people go, you're wasting your life. Why are you doing that with your life? That's what God called us to do. And God said that our rising up and our lying down should be about Him. I, everything and every thought that we have should be about what can we do to glorify God with our actions and the way that we move about. And when we sacrifice things to God and when we give things to God, we think about this. We need to pour our all into Jesus and into Him alone. Everything should be about Him and glorifying Him and honoring Him and the work that we do, the, the places that we go for fun should be done and we should take every opportunity to glorify God in all of that. Oh, why are you able to do the things you do? Because God has blessed me. It's all glory to Him. It's all to His praise. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Everything that we do should be done to glorify God. To, should be done out of love for one another and not the glory of our own self or the things that we have sacrificed. Uh, Mary did not go around saying, look at what I have given to Jesus. Look at, look at what I have done. Everyone gather around, gather around and see what I will pour out on our Lord. Much, much more it was done in such a way that you almost could not not notice how silent she was with the actions that she was using. And she simply just poured out herself to Jesus. Glorify God in whatever we do and in whatever way, it is not a waste.
it is His already. It is His that He has and, and we just have possession of it for a little while. And when we have that mentality, when we have that thought, whether that is considering ourselves with the things that we own or, or the things that we have or, or the time that we use and how we use it, it's all God's already. It's all His. I just am a steward of it for a little while. We gave Him everything for what? What, why, why is it that we would, we would give everything unto Jesus? In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27, uh, the, this is a response to what Jesus had just told the rich young ruler. And if you'll think back, what he had told the rich young ruler was this. He said, uh, what, do you do? what do you need to do? What do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Is what he asked Jesus. And Jesus said, well... You know the commandments, love your father, mother, love all this. He said, well, I've done all of these from my youth. He said, you like one thing. Remember the one thing he liked? He said, sell everything you own. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And that's where his hang up was. And selling everything out to follow Jesus. Well, I don't want to waste everything I've got and just follow after you. This is what Peter said in response to that. Verse 27. See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? (laughs) Okay, Jesus, we did everything you just told that guy to do, so what's in it for us? (laughs) Is your priorities really in the right order? That's almost kind of the way I would think about Peter. Now that you've done left everything, you want to know when you're going to get it back. Now Jesus said to him in verse 28, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed him will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first. He gave up everything to follow Jesus just to have him. And that's what makes it worth it all. Just to have Jesus. I was in search of a song a while back and I, and I couldn't think of what it was, and it, it struggled me. I called a bunch of people, and I, I, I did all kinds of searching and Facebook questionnaires and everything. The title of it was, It Wouldn't Matter to Me. It wouldn't matter to me if the streets were gold or a little dirt road, and my mansion was made of knotted pine. Just as long as I can see the one who gave his life for me and sit down and talk with him for a little while. I'll give up everything for him. And that's what he's asking for. We shouldn't be concerned about what's in it for me or what, what, what am I going to get it out. And we shouldn't definitely consider it a waste. Because anything compared to Jesus is nothing. Everything in comparison to Him is something smaller. We would never consider taking something less in exchange for something greater. I mean, we would consider, uh, you know, some prime time real estate over there by the airport that's worth $150,000 an acre for a little plot of land at $70 an acre in Texas. We would say, well, that would be foolish. We wouldn't trade acre for acre on that. We, we all understand that. We call the difference in selling something for a greater price than our cost, we call that profit. And we're not talking about Elijah and Elisha. We're talking about the difference of the money we're going to make. You buy an apple for 50 cents, you sell it for a dollar. The difference that you made is 50 cents. So you profited 50 cents. And, that, and that's the way that we constantly think about things and we seek after things constantly that will vanish or they will be destroyed or they will rot. We buy things to fill us up or, and they end up making us empty. So what are we purchasing and what are we seeking out? Are we seeking out things that fill us? Or are we seeking things that empty us? 
God fed the children of Israel every day because they were hungry every day. They constantly would strive for more. Now, the day before the Sabbath day, of course, he would give them enough for that day and, and the next day as well on the Sabbath day so they would have to not work and gather. But what would happen to them if they, when they first got it and they said, we're, we're going to gather up all this manna and we're, we're going we're to gather it up. Look, look at how, how much is on the ground. And they gathered it up and they ate all that day. And the next day when they woke up, what happened to all the manna they had gathered the day before? It was ruined. It was rotten. It was full of worms. And, and I can just, just see all of them grubs and maggots and stuff crawling all over that and just how lovely that is and how they would have been so disgusted at it. And they said, we ain't never going to do that again. He fed them every day and took care of them every day and they were hungry every day. But Jesus said he was the bread of life. He said that he was the living water and he that came and drank from him or ate and broke bread from his life would never hunger and never thirst again. In Him is fulfillment. In Him is satisfaction. In Jesus alone is their hope to fill the empty spot that we fill. But because Jesus Christ, He is the one that is going to fill you up. I, I went to uh, Taco Bell. If you've ever been to Taco Bell, you know, it's, it's a great place to eat at. But the thing about eating Taco Bell, for me anyways, is... Uh, it, I, I never leave. I never leave full. <laughs> uh, I, I could eat everything in there, and I never leave full. Uh, Brother Joe said in class the other night. He said Taco Bell always fills me up until I leave the parking lot, and then I want to go somewhere else. <laughs> we try to fill ourselves up, and fill our hearts up, and fill our lives up with something like Taco Bell. And it might fill you up for a little while, but you're gonna be hungry in a little bit. It's not gonna last long. You need to fill yourself up with something that is sustaining throughout all the ups and downs of life, throughout any situation, something that is strong, something that is steadfast, something that is immovable. And the only thing that I have found that is anything like that and is the full clarification of that is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only thing that's going to be able to help us. Why this waste? Now that was worded more of a statement than it really was a question. They weren't really intrigued to Jesus saying, why, why are we wasting this? It was more, why? You're a dummy. Why this waste? It was a challenge to Jesus and Mary of the priority and importance of, of, of what could be done with this oil instead of what you're using it for. Think of all the poor that could be helped. Now for us today, the question could be, is there anything that is done for Jesus that is wasteful? Can we do anything for Jesus and it be a waste? Well, I'm sure someone out there somewhere could think of something, but if we're devoting our lives and we're pouring everything into Jesus, it is not a waste. And Mary knew that. And that's why she was willing to pour out that perfume and that oil upon Jesus because she knew anything for him was not a waste. You have to decide today that you will be filled with Christ and to give him all and you will not waste another moment because he will fulfill every desire. He will fulfill every emotion that you ever thought about having. He is the one who can always be there for us. If, so if you are here this morning and, and you have not made Jesus part of your life, if you have not made yourself a Christian, if you have not been cleansed by the watery grave of baptism to wash away your sins, then that has been a waste. Waste no more of your life and come and follow after Him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, we want you to come as you stand and as we sing. Do you linger, wandering wrong of old of God? Hear ye not the invitation of
again, we're thankful for you being here, and we encourage you to come back tonight at 5 o'clock for our evening of worship. Our closing song being number 839, we'll sing the first and last verse of this song, and then Brother Steve Love will lead us in our closing prayer.